Leading Ideas Talks podcast is brought to you by the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Subscribe free to our weekly e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, at churchleadership.com slash leading ideas. Your capital budget isn't just about facilities. It's about using your facilities to further your church's mission. The Building and Funding Your Capital Budget Video Toolkit shares best practices to help you understand what a capital budget is, how to engage the big questions about your church, and how to assess your current situation. Learn more now at churchleadership.com slash capital budget. And remember, to stay up to date with the latest church leadership strategies and information, Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos. Is your church facing the difficult decision to sell or repurpose property? We speak with Mark Elsden, editor of Gone for Good, about how a congregation can pursue creative uses of church property in a way that avoids common pitfalls and propels their mission forward. Welcome to Leading Ideas Talks. I'm Ann Michael. I'm a senior consultant with the Lewis Center for Church Leadership of Wesley Theological Seminary. I'm also one of the editors of our e-newsletter, Leading Ideas, and I am so delighted to be the host of this episode of Leading Ideas Talks. Uh, My guest today is Mark Elsden, who's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA, And he's the author of two books on how churches and faith-based institutions can use their property assets uh, for good. Uh, The first book came out in 2021, uh, and it's We Aren't Broke, Uncovering Hidden Resources for Mission and Ministry. And he has a new book released this year, Gone for Good, Negotiating the Coming Wave of Church Property Transactions. So uh, welcome to you, Mark. Good to be here. Yeah. So in reading your first uh, book or your earlier book, I should say, uh, We Aren't Broke, um, I was somewhat surprised to learn that your entree into this field of real estate transactions and how faith institutions can use their property creatively to carry their mission forward uh, came when you were serving as a campus minister at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, And just to kind of bring our listeners into your world, can you very briefly share what you did in that context? Yeah, I'm actually here right now. I'm in my office um, at the university um, uh, or at Press House. So uh, I've been an executive director um, and was campus pastor for 20 years um, here at Press House, Presbyterian Affiliated Campus Ministry Center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, And we came into a situation, I say we because my wife, um, Erica Liu, and I uh, were called here together. And we came into a situation where the ministry was essentially... um, empty, dead, sort of in a, in a fallow period, you might say. It had a, a very storied 100-year history, but um, the moment we arrived, there were zero students involved, and the building was falling apart, and it was a pretty dire situation financially, programmatically, and we were kind of tasked with rebuilding it um, in a whole bunch of different ways, and so we set about rebuilding the program and raising some money, and then we did in the end um, it's just vastly simplifying it, but we did in the end um, develop a $17 million seven story uh, student housing facility um, that home, is home for about 240 students um, on the parking lot that was uh, connected to uh, the historic chapel building. Um, mm-hmm. Now, this is a private entity, not university affiliated, but we're right in the heart uh, of the university. Yeah, I was just, you know, you hear of these things happening in, in churches, but um, I had, this is the first time I'd heard of it in a campus ministry. And so I thought it was so interesting that that was, that was um, how you got started with this. Uh, but to put this in a larger context, um, I think all of us who are following this area have seen projections of how many churches might close in the coming decades or how many um, other churches have property assets that no longer fit the current reality of their ministry. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, how big do you think this phenomena of church property transitions is likely to be? Yeah, I mean, I think if the projections are even kind of half half what they're saying, which is 100,000 churches potentially or properties related to churches closing or changing use in the next decade, it's even half that or even a quarter of that, it's a huge number. I mean, it's tens of thousands 
Um, and, you know, it's sort of inevitable when you look at the, 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 the trajectory of in, involvement in, in church activity, or at least traditional church activity, right? You know, the Pew study that shows less than 50%, maybe even 30% um, affiliating uh, with the Christian faith by 2070, that's going to, of course, immediately ripple into, um, into the real estate that's related to that activity, to church real estate. And so, you know, I, I'd be pleasantly happy if I'm wrong and if the others <laughs> yeah. that are projecting this are wrong. Sure. I mean, uh, but I, I think it's going to be massive. I think it's going to be yeah. a massive, a massive sea change. Yeah. You know, it seems to me that it's not just a matter of declining attendance in churches, uh, but it's also a matter in churches that may be healthy and thriving, that the nature of ministry is becoming less place-based uh, and so I think about in my own church, how many groups are now done uh, on Zoom and, you know, the percentage of the staff that's working from home for some period, you know, part of the week. And it's just really changed, I think, the way churches use their property, even if they are are in a healthy place. Yeah. And in fact, I always encourage healthy churches to think about this now, because then you have the opportunity to actually do exciting new things versus sort of crisis management, you know, or clo or closing management, which is, which is important too. But yeah, absolutely. I think in addition to the, what you're describing, there's also the phenomenon of um, just different ways of engaging the Christian faith. So, you know, for many decades, it was quite traditional in the sense it would come on Sunday morning for worship and then maybe go down the hall to a Sunday school class and, um, and then maybe a Wednesday meal or something midweek, you know, and, and that's kind of the pattern. And, and that's just changed a great deal. So some of that's gone online, some of that's gone remote. And then also some of it is just people want to engage in a different way. Right. They want to be a part More of a completely folk. different. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, you know, in, in high priced urban real estate markets, um, I live in downtown Washington, D.C. And, you know, uh, what I've been observing is that, um, there are a lot of churches, at least forward thinking churches that have been engaged in creative redevelopment or creative use of their property for several decades now. Um, your new book, uh, Gone for Good, is a compilation of chapters written by a very diverse group of church leaders, civic leaders, real estate and planning professionals um, in a variety, from a variety of different contexts. And so I think you probably have a better sense than I do of um, the opportunities and challenges in different areas of the country, rural, urban, suburban. Um, how do you see the lay of that land broadly? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think broadly, first of all, it's this transition is happening across the entire nation um, and across denominations. And so, you know, there's maybe pockets of it that are different. And obviously any one individual church might be growing or thriving versus not or changing or not. But broadly speaking, across denomination, across theological lines, across geographic areas, the general trend is the same. Um, and so that I think is just interesting to note. I mean, I hear stories that are very similar in Washington, D.C., in Seattle, in San Francisco, but also in rural Wisconsin, in rural Texas, in rural Alabama. It doesn't, you know, everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, we might be slightly different in terms of timing or whatnot. Um, and, and what you note about kind of the implications and the possibilities are a little bit different, obviously, in an urban center where property values are very high, where the real estate is literally valuable financially, um, and the needs might be of one nature, then you end up with projects that kind of lend themselves to that situation. And then in a rural setting where those things might be very different, um, where a rural community has been in decline for a long time and really the property has not got sort of the same financial value, but a church still has a real important center um, to play in a community, then it's a different set of outcomes that you end up with and uses of that property that you end up with. Yeah, so that one of the chapters in the book uh, addresses the ways that rural churches are using their properties to meet community needs. Um, I, I found that really, really interesting. Um, do you want to speak to that briefly? Yeah, I found that super interesting too because I'm not. In, I'm while I'm surrounded by rural settings in Wisconsin, I'm not in one myself, and so I, I had a lot to learn from that, and I continue to learn from people that are 
experimenting in that way. Um, but yeah, that chapter highlights the importance, the centrality of churches in, 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 in rural settings and essentially invites that to continue just in different forms, right? So some of the examples that I think are really interesting is um, I'm churches have been that are near interstates have been putting electric car charging stations in their parking lot just as an act of hospitality okay. and revenue yeah. generation. You know, mm -hmm. why not? That's a kind of a, an interesting well, it's kind idea. of like churches that were hosting uh, cell phone towers. That was sure. Uh, yes, exactly. It's uh, in that uh, same vein. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, and then there's others that have been doing um, uh, health care partnerships with health care providers that might want to come into a community uh, and maybe provide, you know, say three hours of healthcare three days a week with a nurse practitioner, but they don't have the means or the need to build an entire standalone clinic. But they actually do need a, a set of areas to provide healthcare, and a church's unused kind of education wing could be perfect for that, right? And then it builds, it starts to rebuild that place as a center of gravity, and maybe a small farmers market pops up once a week, and. Uh, you know, you know, so you kind of start from that and build some sense of community again around that space. Um, I've seen some uh, more rural churches looking at doing small senior housing, um, but not huge ones, maybe, you know, a handful of units. Um, but that allows seniors in their community to stay and age in place there rather than have to move to the city and find a retirement community. And so that's another interesting idea. So there's lots, I think as people get creative, they come up with, with, with really great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are some um, really uh, wonderful success stories uh, profiled in your book, like uh, Emory Fellowship uh, United Methodist Church here in Washington, D.C., that created uh, 99 units of affordable housing on its church property. I, I wanted to ask you personally, uh, if there's a particular um, story or example of, of a church that's, uh, you know, worked in this area of creative uh, property uh, redevelopment that, that you really find most interesting or most inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I love the story of, uh, of Reverend Daniel's church in, in um, Emory and Ashley Goff's uh, church in Arlington. And those stories of affordable housing are super, super exciting to me. There's one that came up recently I, that I think is very interesting, and that is um, um, in uh, the uh, Portland area, a church uh, that was closed was recently um, given essentially to a coalition of indigenous leaders um, that are going to take that property and develop tiny homes on it to support um, women and children in the uh, First Nations community there that are experiencing homelessness. And to me, that's a beautiful act of both property reuse and also a, an act of restoration and sort of recognition of that land and whose land that who lived on that land many, you know, um, many years ago. And uh, and a, a beautiful act of just thinking differently about how to kind of repurpose a, a church that had lived its life and, and its property had lived its life. And it was time to think differently about it and to just sort of hand it over in a generous way. Um, uh, to some other leaders in the community for them to use it for real community needs. I, I, I think that's a particularly inspiring story. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, to, to follow up on this idea of, of some of the successful examples, uh, I wanted to ask you, what would you say are some of the common factors that underlie um, the success of churches that are able to um, make good decisions and, and navigate the often very unfamiliar and complicated terrain of selling or redeveloping property. Yeah, I think the thing that we're starting to see, um, uh, so my other organization, Rooted Good, we work with, with churches and we support them through a, our Good Futures Accelerator program as they're trying to think about this stuff and come up with ideas and test ideas. And probably the number one thing that we see that is really, really critical is listening good intentional thoughtful listening to the community um i mean to be totally frank as a member of the church and as a clergy member we often think we know more about what people need than than we actually do and uh and we have we, we often think hey let's give them this or let's do this and this is what everyone needs and wants and we might be right but very often we're not um or we're not quite right and so there's a lot of um listening needed to understand what's happening in a community what the true needs are what the true opportunities are where god is already at work and um sort of coming alongside where god is already at work in the community um 
definitely not read an article about my book or anybody else's book that says build affordable housing and then just go build affordable housing. I love affordable housing, but don't take a, something off the shelf and just plop it into your setting. That that does not work. In fact, that's the sort of a recipe for not working. Um, so you really got to listen to what's going on in the community and try to respond to that. And it might be affordable housing, but it might completely not be that, you know, and um, so that's probably the number one thing that, that that we've seen be really important is that kind of listening, that listening posture. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that idea that sort of a, a copycat approach, I mean, that's true in so many areas of ministry and, and congregational revitalization. You can't just copy what some other successful church has done. And I think this issue of uh, related to church property is so highly contextual. I mean, you know, it matters where you are and what the zoning is and what the property values are and what your neighborhood is like. I mean, it, it, I, 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 it may be overstated it to say that no two churches are alike in this regard, but I think it's probably true. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've probably already already uh, spoken to this, but um, I, I I also wanted to ask about some of the the pitfalls um, <laughs> that that need to be avoided, and and you've already mentioned you know relying on churches um, the the their own sense of what they think the community needs, but are there are there other are there other pitfalls to be avoided as, as a church walks down this path? Yeah, I mean, there certainly are. I'm always a little reticent to, to talk a lot about that because I think most, many of us, at least in mainline settings, we jump to pitfalls so quickly. And so I actually, my tendency is to try to encourage experimentation and trial and to not be afraid of failing because we might. Um, and and in, some way, in some ways we, we will fail if we do this work or we will make mistakes. So I don't want to, you know, but that is that said, yes, there are definitely some pitfalls. Um, one, you know, one related to the real estate very specific is just being aware that there that there are a lot of other players involved that have a great deal at stake when it comes to a church real estate question. So it might be developers, for example, in the area that want to access property at low cost and do something and make some money on it. And so lots of churches, unfortunately, have gotten taken advantage of with regard to the value of their property. So they, um, I'm not at all for prop, for d dollar maximization. If you've read either of my books, you'll get that sense. However, I'm also not a big fan of churches getting taken advantage of and uh, and having you know for-profit developers just come swoop in and, and sort of take their property at very low, um, low cost and then make a ton of money on it for themselves and privatize it. And, and you know, that, that does happen, unfortunately. So that's a pitfall. I think that requires some some careful understanding of those dynamics and those relationships. Um, uh, you know, even cities as well and other di players in the mix are going to have things at stake, and the church is going to need to be aware that that they may or may not align with their interests, and that the church is going to have to sort of um, you know hold out for its own interest a bit. I think probably one of the other major ones again that we're seeing is waiting too long. So it's amazing how often I, I, I get somebody reach out saying we've got 18 months left um, and what can we do? You know, we need some help. And 18 months is not long enough. Um, it's certainly not long enough to do a real big development project. I mean, Reverend Daniels took 10 years, you know, to do. I would say at, more. I, I, yeah. I witnessed it from <laughs> yeah. the very beginning. Yeah. Sure. At, at minimum. Yeah. And that was probably with 10 years prior to that, you know, mm -hmm. of thinking about it. So. Ours was uh, was an 80 year thing. We mm -hmm. had the first dream came around in 1927 and we opened in 2007. I'm not saying we need to take 80 years now every time, but 18 months is not long enough. Um, and uh, so kind of the wait, 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 wait. Can we make it? Can we make it? Oh, no, we can't. Now we should talk about this is not very helpful. It's much more productive. Um, and life giving, frankly, to start that conversation earlier. And like you said at the beginning, even if you're not thinking of closing, just thinking more creatively about the use of property, um, the use of the buildings, the use of the land, how can we use it for ministry and mission and maybe for some revenue generation? And let's think about that right now. Why wait? And uh, um, so that would be probably the biggest other pitfall we're seeing a lot of is, is just kind of a bit of head in the sand and waiting and hoping and then and then coming at the last minute and saying we need some help well you know you do your best in that scenario but if you can start earlier that's very helpful 
Yeah, well, kind of related to that, and, and, and you know, this idea of how long this can take uh, to do to do successfully. Um, you know, thinking about this from a leadership perspective, um, you know, I, I I saw the amount of effort and time and uh, that it took Joe Daniels, for example, to do what he was able to accomplish. Um, I, I think it takes a, a, a uh, an extraordinary amount of leadership capital, <laughs> leadership expertise to to do this successfully. I think it's also probably safe to say that um, most of the clergy serving in our churches today don't have extensive training in real estate transactions or community redevelopment or affordable housing and the like. And, um, you know, I, I teach in the areas of stewardship and finance, and I, I would go so far to say that a, a lot of people entering ministry are struggling with just the basics of financial management. And, you know, congregations, too, as you've just said, often have a hard time sort of facing their financial realities and embracing change. And so, I, I, I guess my question is, you know, where, how, how do congregations rally the leadership? Where does the leadership impetus come from, the, the vision and the skills in order, you know, that are required to do this successfully? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it is probably sort of the question in many cases that kind of leads to it moving or not moving. Um, I'm going to give three brief answers to that. So one, one is, I think, it is very interesting when we created our good futures accelerator at rooted good we initially thought we were going to sort of screen churches for which ones were ready to do it or not ready to do it and which ones would be successful or not and if we had done that we would have really messed up um, because covid covid happened and so we didn't screen anyone and we just let everyone try it and we were amazed by the churches that actually were successful were not always the ones we thought were necessarily going to be and so in some cases you know one case a church that has very, very few members of very, very few leaders and no pastor has had no pastor for years is doing an incredible um, affordable housing project um, in California. Right. And so we would have thought, well, they weren't going to be ready for that, you know, but they it, it really it, it, it often just requires somebody or some bodies that are willing to sort of work the process and just take the steps. Um, to do the listening, to do the learning, to build the partnerships and the relationships and to go from there. Um, so the second one I would say is, is thinking much more broadly about who's involved in these projects. So we're great in the church to, of taking it all on ourselves. You know, we shovel the snow in our area, we cut the grass, you know, we, and I say we like church members do this, right? Um, and especially if we've kind of in a tough spot financially, that's the case. We're, that's not going to work with social enterprise projects or development projects. You, you're not going to do it yourself. You're not going to be signing leases with residents. You're not going to be maintaining a, a building, you know, that houses people. Um, you, you know, even just a smaller social enterprise is going to require partnership, a, a legal legal support, accounting, potentially other staff, and so on and so forth. And uh, and so thinking much more broadly about who's involved in this project, this is not just a necessarily a project of the people in the church at this moment. And that's a great opportunity also to extend the reach of the congregation and to involve other people. So that's the second thing. The partnership is key. And then the third, I would say, the theme we've been seeing is um, starting with sort of something small, not necessarily thinking we got to do a 99 unit. 60 million dollar affordable housing project as the very first thing we do um that's pretty daunting right for for a lot i mean I, i'd be daunted to do that even though i've done it before right um it's a huge undertaking and worth worth pursuing for sure but we don't have to it's like exercising we don't have to go to the gym for five hours in the first day if we get back to exercising you know we haven't exercised some of these muscles um, around uh, this kind of work for a very long time, uh, for many of us in the church. So let's just start with like a little something first and get into it, right? So maybe if you're interested in some kind of a new venture with a commercial kitchen, it involves social entrepreneurs, uh, food entrepreneurs coming in and using a commercial kitchen to grow their business and you want to develop a partnership in the community, maybe just start with a food truck on your parking lot you know, three Fridays in the summer, you know, pick three Fridays in the summer and invite a food truck to show up in your parking lot. And just that's it. That's the beginning. Kind of begin the exercise, that muscle around innovation and around social enterprise and learn what's required from that little thing. Is there are there permits required and how do we account for it and all that? 
and then move to the bigger project. Um, you know, so not diving all the way in immediately and kind of starting with something smaller and then building some momentum and some excitement is a great way um, uh, to get going. Um, so those would be the sort of responses I have initially to that uh, to that question. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe you've already answered this question, but 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 I wanted to ask about, you know, what 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 are some of the very first steps that a congregation um, that's interested in assessing its options might take? I mean, you've already talked about listening, um, but 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 are there some things that even precede that? I mean, is there are there questions related to understanding your, you know, your assets, your value, your um, uh, your building. I mean, what what are some other first steps? Yeah. So the process we take churches through typically we actually save questions of the building and the and sort of financial assets down to a little bit later, um, starting more with kind of the mission questions. So in our sense, the practical questions they can work themselves out if the mission questions are clear. But so, yes, listening is probably the, 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 the beginning. And then the other thing that's at the beginning that's often helpful is thinking about where the church has done this before. And in most cases, we have done it before, even if we feel like we haven't. Um, and I don't mean it as in building affordable housing or doing a commercial kitchen venture, maybe not that, but we've done something new, something innovative, or we have some legacy to build upon. So rarely do I see projects uh, come completely out of the blue. Um, they often have some tie to something that the congregation has done in the past or has talked about in the past. So like I said here, it was an 80 years ago, this idea of doing student housing, and then we finally did it. And um, Reverend Daniels is a great example too. They have they have a his history of housing people and of addressing that issue that goes back centuries actually on that property. And, that, um, and, and I've seen churches look at converting um, a beloved food pantry ministry, for example, into a, a community owned grocery co-op. Um, and so they're kind of building upon the legacy that they already have of something that they already love and know how to do, and then expanding it and kind of going from there rather than just dragging something off the shelf that's totally foreign to them and trying to adopt that. Um, and, and since the pandemic, you know, almost all congregations have pivoted and innovated in some way or another, right? Absolutely. And I think so, congregations have shown yeah. how cool they are, right? So we actually, yeah. we actually start our accelerator. The very beginning of it is reflecting on what have we already done? What stories can we tell ourselves and remind ourselves about of where have we innovated in the past? Where have we exercised that muscle in the past? And, um, and how has that given us life? And, you know, and, and how has God shown up in that? And that is a wonderful starting point. And then, and then move from there into listening in the community and into the following steps. Yeah, so maybe I would say that as, you know, sort of discerning your missional heart and, and working in alignment with what the, the missional heart of the congregation has been. I, I think that's true in so many areas of, of ministry development. Uh, so to bring this to a close, um, you know, I, you've already alluded to the fact that how churches use their property, it isn't just uh, a question of finances or, um, you know, maximizing the, the economic possibilities. It's also a question of responsible stewardship. And I, I appreciate that your book looks not just at the financial aspects of property transactions, but also at some of the moral and, and theological considerations as well. And so uh, to bring this to a close, I, I wondered if you can speak to um, how a church can make sure that it remains faithful to its its values and its beliefs in this process. Yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, both of my books at the very core are really a, a reflection, um, a call to reflect on our role as sort of stewards of what we have been given, right? And so in my view, all of what we've been given, I mean, this is true individually, but it's certainly for congregations, is really a gift from God to make use of it for the time that we have it. That's our financial resources, our investments, our property, you know, um, particularly when we recognize where that property might have come from or where that mo money might have come from in the past. And so, um, you know, we we have this chance to steward those resources and to, to use those resources for the good of God's work in the world. And that's fundamentally the question that I think is most important. And the rest of the other questions about budgets, pro formas, you know, all that other stuff, they flow from there and they can get worked out from there. 
Um, but kind of returning to the core each time is really important um, in my view and, and is what in some ways separates the church from any other entity as well, um, that we are driven by that and that we are, um, that we are uh, it's something bigger than us. It isn't just this congregation and this congregation's building and this congregation's land. We are a part of a much bigger story uh, and I'm not even just talking about a denomination, but I'm talking about the whole story of God's people, right? And um, and and that to me is really vital uh, at life giving as well, um, and kind of a, a hopeful place to to start from. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, your book is Gone for Good: Negotiating the Coming Wave of Church Property Transitions, and it, it took me a while I was, as I was reading the book to realize that gone for good is kind of a play on words because it's it's not just uh on the one hand your church might be gone for good permanently your property on the other hand it can be gone for the greater good uh exactly so that's kind of the framework that you bring to this um thank you so much for these really important books that i think are helping people understand uh the possibilities of this and for your enthusiasm and your work in this area it's been great talking to you today mark it's been a pleasure thank you Thanks for joining us for Leading Ideas Talks. Please like and subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon to get updates for new videos.